My name is Wendy Eaton. I'm the Administrative Assistant for Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and for the Emma and Joseph Smith Historic Site here in Nauvoo. For our evening's devotion, I'd like to open with a reading from Doctrine and Covenants, section 165. This is right at the end of the section. Beloved community of Christ, do not just speak and sing of Zion. Live, love, and share as Zion. Those who would strive to be visibly one in Christ, among whom there are no poor or oppressed. As Christ's body, lovingly and patiently bear the weight of criticism from those who hesitate to respond to divine vision of human worth and equality in Christ. This burden and blessing is yours for divine purposes. Even though I'm the administrative assistant every now and then, I get out of the office and I get to give tours. And right at the end of last summer, I was able to give a tour to two new Community of Christ members. One individual kept asking questions about how the modern temple here in Nauvoo is viewed by Community of Christ members. That was challenging enough, but it was his companion who was asking even tougher questions. She wanted to know about race relations within Community of Christ, especially from the time of the American Civil Rights Movement. And I had to admit to her that I have not studied much history after 1900. I filled in a little bit of understanding as it pertained to before the 1900s, but that's really looking back at 1840s Nauvoo. That's not the time period that she wanted in particular. And so I slowly started working my way through a book by a man named Roger Lanius called Invisible Saints. He covers a history of the Black experience within Community of Christ over the years. And I came across the name Pauline Frisbee and thought, that's someone that I would really like to get to know a little bit better. I didn't have time at that point to look into her story, but I have plenty of time now. And so I started trying to find Pauline Frisbee. What I found is a fascinating story of a woman who was born in 1908 and raised in Pontiac, Michigan. Her parents joined the church in 1916. She joined the church while she was in high school. And in 1934, she married a man named Clarence Frisbee. Clarence encouraged Pauline's interest in music. While in high school, she had been in various choirs and their school even had yearly operas and she had small roles in some of those. And so she went ahead and pursued this study and took about three years of private voice training at the Detroit Institute of Arts before moving to New York. And she continued her voice training under three different vocal coaches. By about this point, the United States had become involved in World War II. And like many people around her, Pauline became active in supporting the effort to do everything that the citizens could to make life bearable for everyone in this time. And so she, using her skills in music, she's helping support the war bond effort by participating in various concerts. The, towards the end of the war, she lands the role of Cindy in the Broadway production of a musical called Carmen Jones, which is described as being a smash hit, but I had never heard of it until I started studying Pauline. This musical ran for about two years, and it traveled not only in New York City, but in Boston and in Philadelphia. So Pauline was getting to be a fairly well-known singer in her own right in this time. After the war's over, and especially once her daughter is beginning to enter her teen years, Pauline becomes very active in church activities back home in Detroit, Michigan. The Saints heralds throughout the 1950s are sprinkled with accounts of her singing at district conferences at the Blue Water Reunion. It's, uh, there's a wonderful article from Roy Cheville where she's visiting Graceland in time for the homecoming while her daughter's a student there. And she's chosen to sing the benediction at their closing worship on that Sunday of homecoming weekend. 
and in the 1954 General Conference, she was chosen to be a soloist in one of the Sunday worship services during that time. So she was pretty well known for her music, and as wonderful as her musical career must have been, I'd love to explore a little bit more of it if I can. There are three incidents that happen about 10 years later that really caught my attention, especially when thinking back to that question I had over the summer about the race relations in the United States. So in 1967, Pauline is living in Detroit when the horrific race riots take place. This was about a week of just terrible rioting and arson and looting and even death. And she experiences this firsthand. A few months after the riots, they had happened in the summer, uh, Saints Herald columnists had asked a number of the church members who were living in Detroit to talk about their experience to help everyone else understand what they had lived through. Pauline is one of those who contributes her testimony, and I'm going to read her words here. She writes about how her home escaped the chaos of those five days, but the music school where she taught in the afternoons a couple days a week lost $12,000 worth of equipment. The building thankfully survived, but the market next door, as she said, was nothing but a charred mass. She closes her testimony with, I knew without a doubt God would lead, guide, and protect. And certainly over the next several months of Pauline's life, she is certainly being led and guided by God. In April the following year, 1968, she is at the General Conference in Independence, Missouri. This is a conference where William T. Blue sponsored a resolution entitled Gospel to Racial and Ethnic Groups. Pauline stood to speak in support of this resolution, and thanks to the transcriptions, we have most of her words. So I'm going to again read her words as she expressed to the conference why this resolution was so important. I am deeply aware that this gospel is to be taken to all people, all races. But there has been, even in the attitudes and in the actions, and in the non-actions, and in the indifference, a lack of even being interested in taking the gospel primarily to my people. We need to reach out a little bit more and take the gospel to the people who are hungry among the Negro race. This resolution is adopted, and to further explain herself, Pauline submits an article to the Saints Herald that is published in August of 1968, uh, slightly more than a year after she had experienced this protection and guidance from God at that time. I could quote the entire article to you, but I won't. I will post it down in the comments so that you can read it for yourself if you so choose. I'm going to leave you with her closing words of this article, because even though she was focused at the time on race relations, I think these words are pretty powerful for us today. So Pauline writes, people are being faced with the need to overcome traditions based on myths and false ideas, which have been handed down from generation to generation. These saints with whom we share the wonderful spirit of Christ are aware of these conditions to some extent. We pray that one day all of our hearts will become tuned as one in the spirit of love and that our lives will demonstrate this love until it fills the universe.